to 94%, and only 1% have a fingerprint that we saw more than twice. So uh, this is the same thing on a graph. Note that this graph has log axes. If you drew this graph um, of, of how common the different fingerprints were without log axes, you end up with a graph where the, the line runs exactly along this axis all the way and then exactly along this one. So in order to see any structure, you have to put it on log scales. But the important thing to note is that 84% of the data is right down here in this section on the tail. It's unique. And then there's another group of people, about 20,000 people who have an anonymity set size of two. It means there were two p browsers that had that fingerprint. You know, a smaller group with three, four, five, and then right up the other end, you have a small number of browser fingerprints that were not very unique. Um, the one right at the top is a Firefox instance that's not running JavaScript. So a, like a recent version of Fi Firefox with no JavaScript, you have a de decent amount of anonymity. There's an interesting statistical question that you might ask, which is, OK, sure, you saw 94% or 84% uniqueness in your data set, but that was only 500,000 people. Would people be less unique if we could get data for the whole 1 to 2 billion people who use the web? Um, and this is an interesting statistical question. Uh, I have a theory about how to solve it involving Monte Carlo simulations. You try a, a, a hypothesis probability distribution, you run it through a simulation, you see if it produces a graph that looks like that. But we didn't try to do this because in a sense, our data set, which is just a measurement of privacy conscious users, is not meaningfully representative of the one to two billion browsers in existence. So if someone else has a, like, a less biased data set, you could do this statistical question. We didn't try. Uh, now, any graph that tries to show you everything that's going on in this data set is going to be really complicated because it's half a million data points. But I'm going to try with a couple of them. This one shows for each category of browsers, so Firefox, IE, Opera, Chrome, Android, iPhone, Conqueror, Blackberry, Safari, and then a lump together collection of, of links and te other text mode browsers. For each of those, how good or bad was it from a uniqueness trackability point of view? And so if you look at this graph, anything that's over here is a proportion of uniqueness. Um, these things were completely unique in our data set. The other end, we have the least revealing fingerprints. Um, so let's take an example. Firefox is this black line. It follows this curve down here where it has a little bit of a tail in the non-unique area. That's because some people had JavaScript turned off in Firefox or they were running Tor button and, and it, uh, it shows up as Firefox. And then right up here, there's a very large number of unique Firefoxes. The, the, all of the desktop browsers, aside from Firefox, are like that, but without this little tail of non-unique people. So generally, desktop browsers are bad. The browsers that did well, iPhone. The iPhone does very well. It's not very fingerprintable. It's this purple line, and there are quite a lot of iPhones that are not unique. Um, that's perhaps not surprising because there aren't yet plugins and font variation on iPhones. Um, really, all you're talking about is what time zone you're in, what language you're in, maybe which version of the iPhone OS you have. But there's not very much to, to fingerprint an iPhone with. Android does almost as well. Not quite as well because there are more iPhones than Androids. Um, but those phone browsers look pretty good. In practice, of course, they have really bad cookie settings, so people who use them probably get tracked by their cookies. But um, this was a good result for the phones. Um, I'll, I'll let you guys ask more questions about these crazy graphs at the end. Now, if we look at the variables that we measured, we had these eight measurements, and say, which ones were the problematic ones? This table measures to first order, which they were. So user agent is pretty bad. It's 10 bits of information. Every time you log in your web server logs, the user agent, you expect on average that you're narrowing the population down to 1,000th of what it could have been if, you're, if someone wants to, to browse anonymously. Um, the things that were worse. Plugins, 15.4 bits. Fonts, about 14 bits. So these things that your browser publishes are very revealing. If you want to ask, OK, what is the distribution of different 
values for all of these things look like, you end up with this crazy graph here. Um, it's in our paper as well. I can try to explain it. It says, how many people, for, for, for each of these measurements separately, there are eight different measurements. For each one, how many people fell into an anonymity set size of, of K for each of the measurements? So an anonymity set size of one means you are completely unique because of your fingerprints or your font or your, your plugins. So you see up here, there are a lot of people who are unique, 200,000, 250,000 people who are unique just because of the plugins they had installed in their browser. There were 200,000 who are unique just because of their fonts. 20,000, 25,000 who are unique just because of their user agent, etc. As you go down here, these are less identifying values. And then along this line, we have um, right up to the, the end, having cookies enabled wasn't a very revealing fact. So if anyone has questions about, oh, you know, like, what does this data look like? You can come back and study this graph and, and pour over it for half an hour or ask me questions about it. So another really interesting question you might have is, so sure, you can identify people, but don't these fingerprints change over time? Are they really a stable way to track someone if they could upgrade their browser or, or install a new font and suddenly the fingerprint would be different? And so we decided to, to check this. Um, this graph shows the set of people who visited Panopticlick exactly twice. So we wanted to, to throw away people who might have been playing with the site, trying to optimize their uniqueness or, or tweak things. We just wanted people who came exactly twice with at least an hour or two in between um, the two visits that they did. So they didn't just hit reload, they came back later. And then we said, as a function of how much later they came back, what was the probability that their fingerprint had changed? And you can see, as, as more time has passed, the likelihood that the fingerprint was different when they came back goes up. We measured this, by the way, with cookies. So th there was a cookie that you could reliably use to see the same person, and then you can see if the fingerprint changes. So actually, fingerprints don't last very long. The half-life of these things is four or five days. So perhaps that's actually a really good sign. Perhaps fingerprints, while they're instantaneously identifying, aren't a stable way to track people over time. Unfortunately, this turned out not to be true. So the way we did that is we said, okay, your fingerprint has changed. Can we do some kind of fuzzy matching algorithm that will see if your fingerprint later after the change was uniquely tieable to your fingerprint beforehand? And I implemented a really hacky algorithm to do this. Um, it just says if only one of those eight measurements has changed and it hasn't changed very much, uh, and that maps to a unique fingerprint from beforehand, then let's guess that it's you. Uh, and it only tries to do this if you had something quite revealing like Flash or Java installed. So this algorithm guesses about two thirds of the time, but when it does guess, it's 99% accurate. So it has a 99% chance of correctly guessing which fingerprint you changed from and less than 1% chance of getting it wrong. So even though fingerprints change quite fast, even though the half-life of a fingerprint is, ha is five days, actually, uh, you're still trackable once your fingerprint has changed. So there were really only four examples of categories of browsers that survived this. I mentioned them all quickly in passing. If you block JavaScript, perhaps with no script, uh, the Firefox extension to do that, you're in pretty good shape. If you use Tor Button, Tor Button zaps the plugin list and a whole, it, the, the Tor Button developers knew about a lot of these attacks and, and anticipated them in various ways. So Tor Button, you don't have to use Tor, you can just use the little Tor Button Firefox extension, you're in pretty good shape. If you use an iPhone or an Android and you manage the cookie problem, you're in pretty good shape. And lastly, this you know, small percentage of systems that were behind, clone f cl uh, behind firewalls and appeared to have the same fingerprint. We saw about 3% of IP addresses that had multiple visitors coming from them exhibiting that kind of behavior. So that 3% of, of, of systems maybe has some kind of anonymity, although it's a bit hard to distinguish that from a browser's private browsing mode. And it, it would also be the case that if you implemented the clock skew hardware-based fingerprinting, you could probably tell people apart even if they have a firewall and a, a cloned fingerprint. So 
currently there aren't very many web browsers that do well. We also saw some other really interesting things. Um, one interesting thing was that sometimes privacy enhancing technologies are the opposite. Uh, something that's designed to hide your identity turns out to be the unique thing that tracks you. Uh, if you install a flash blocker, uh, for instance, that has a unique signature that you can tell, okay, this browser has flash installed, but we're not getting an answer back from the flash plugin when we ask it for fonts. So people who've done that were all pretty much unique. People who forged their user agents, actually something I forgot to say about this graph. Let's go back here. Let's look at this graph here. Remember how I said this is the iPhone in pink, this pink line? And you go over here and these iPhones aren't very unique. And then there's a little group of iPhones up here on the right that is unique. And what's going on there? Why are some iPhones unique? Well, it turns out if you look at this, actually a large portion of those iPhones aren't iPhones. Uh, this, this graph just believes the user agent string. But if you go and look, some of these have uh, Flash Player installed and other stuff that gives them away is actually not being iPhones. They're desktop browsers masquerading as iPhones. And we scratched our heads when we saw this and thought, why are so many people pretending to be iPhones? And then it, it, we realized that actually AT&T had had a promotion for a long time where they, they gave you free Wi-Fi for your iPhone. And uh, the only way they checked that was the user agent string. Uh, so I think they've fixed that now. Um, but the lesson here is, OK, that's funny, but uh, also if you want to fake your user agent string, you have to fake more than your user agent string. Uh, you have to fake all the other stuff uh, that distinguishes an iPhone from a desktop machine. And if you don't, then you're in danger of creating yourself a unique fingerprint. Similarly, there was a, you know, a very distinctive bunch of Firefox machines that supported Internet Explorer's ActiveX user data cookies. You know, okay, those are probably not Firefox. Um, the exceptions to this, this problematic rule about privacy enhancing stuff defeating your privacy, the, the noteworthy exceptions were NoScript and Tor Button, which both are fingerprintable, but the amount you gain from having them turned on uh, outweighs the amount you lose from them. Another lesson here is that there's a trade-off, um, well, sorry, actually, wrong slide. Um, another lesson here is that if you're designing an API that's going to run inside a browser, you should never, ever offer some call that returns a gigantic list of system information uh, about the machine that you're running on. So this was true both of the plugin list, where you just asked navigator.plugins, hey, give me the plugins on the system, and you get back a list of all of them and the version numbers of all of them, because that's going to make a lot of people unique. <laughs> Similarly, don't return a list of all the fonts. If you really need to, uh, to show people a particular font, make them, make them ask about the specific font, rather than being able to ask about all fonts at once. Um, perhaps an even better solution to this would be to not have your system fonts displayed in your browser at all. Uh, perhaps if a, if a website wants to render this crazy Frankenstein font I've got here, it should have to give you the TTF file along with the website. Um, the problem here is that even if we block the bits of Java and Flash that give font lists back, there are some nasty websites out there that show that you can detect fonts using CSS, which is almost unblockable. Um, you just render the font inside an invisible box and then measure how wide it is. And so if, it's, if the user has the font installed, the box is width A. And if they don't have it installed, it's width B. Uh, and there's a little cute website called Flipping Typical that demonstrates this. So this stuff is hard to block. Another lesson is that uh, fingerprintability trades off against debuggability. So if you look at a user agent string, just a hypothetical one here, and this is the typical stuff it has in there. My operating system, uh, I'm running X particular hardware uh, platform, my language, uh, precise date that my Gecko was built on, all this stuff. Why is that in there? Like, Why does every website I go to need to know what date my browser was compiled on? Like, What are we doing here? The answer is some people thought that maybe one day we'd want to debug something. And when we did, wouldn't it be awesome if we'd, logged, if we'd already logged on the server side all of the stuff we could possibly want for debugging a client-side issue? 
And okay, fair enough, maybe occasionally there's some glitch somewhere where having this version information is useful. But